when you have a problem on the right side of the brain, there is a chance that the person will deny the symptoms. And this is a symptom called anosognosia. That is the inability to identify the impairment. You think they just don't know something is wrong. Hello, welcome man, kumusta? Thank you for joining me. This is how your occupational therapist and welcome to OT Conversations. What do we want to talk about today? Again, we can just have a discussion about some simple case scenarios of little things that I have encountered over the years or perhaps you have encountered or you may encounter. So I am faced with this woman who complained of feeling dizzy. And she's quite young, to be fair, probably in her 50s. And on this charge, the doctors felt that this person can be discharged home because there's no outstanding problem. But this woman is complaining of dizziness and this was her worry. And so I went to see the person straight away. So I listened to her and just to ask what the symptoms are. She said that her symptoms and main concern was that she's dizzy. Okay, so what can be the things that could cause dizziness? One, you, when your blood pressure is low, yes, you may have dizziness. If you have some problems with your ears, you may have dizziness. If you have labyrinthitis, you can have dizziness. And then another thing would be when you have a posterior or cerebellar stroke. This is something that you... And I wanted to explore more on this dizziness. So what I did, the person was sitting down. And what I did was I asked the person to shake her head left and then stay at the center at the beginning. Can you picture that, guys? So move your head left and right very quickly and then get the head stable and steady straight away at the center. So I asked her to do that quick left and right and left and then keep the head steady and straight at the center. But I don't know what procedure is this. And I don't know what kind of special test is this. But this is over the years, I have come up with this and I have noticed this, which is also similar to uh, a few people. And what you are looking for is that bounciness on the head. And when I asked about this, the person did say, yes, it's quite spongy. It's quite bouncy. Okay, that is symptom one. And then the next thing that I did was I asked her to do an alternating clapping or with your right hand. If you're testing for the right hand, you do a clapping motion with the right hand, with the left hand being on supine. And what you do with your right hand is you do an alternate clapping with your right hand on palm to palm and palm to the back of your palm. So that's what you needed to do with the left hand being just plain palm open facing up. That's what you need to do. So I did that. I did that with her with the right hand. And if you can picture this, you can probably hear this me doing this sound. So it's almost like a clapping movement. And she can do that well with the right hand. And then I asked her to do the same thing with the left hand as well. And with the left hand, is not as smooth as that of the right hand. Granted that there may be difference between right-handed people and left-handed people, but you need to observe the quality of the movement. And the person herself was saying, this does not appear to be as easy as that of the other hand. So that's what she said. And while she was doing this, I'm also doing it with myself because I wanted to use myself as a 
a reference. Because if I can do it, and if I have difficulty, then another person might also have difficulty as well. So I can do it. Yes, with the left hand, I can do it personally, a little bit less coordinated than the right hand. But it's not as bad as compared to the person that I was working with. So that was one of the things that I asked her to do. So there are two things that have happened already. So first would be the sponginess of the head movement. The next thing would be that left hand is not as coordinated as the other one. I asked her to do finger to nose test. So I did a finger to nose test with the right hand, which would have been a good side. And she was able to point to her nose. She was able to point to my finger. And while she was doing that, I was moving my finger around so that she can target my finger. So her nose and my finger. So it's like finger to nose. With the right hand is more targeted. She can do that. No problem. With her left hand, there is a bit of a situation where she needs to concentrate a little bit more. And she's finding it difficult to target my finger. It's not a hundred percent, but it's not very bad. Somehow it's just impaired. Then the other thing that I did was in bed. What I asked her to do is do a heel to shin test. This involves moving the heel of one leg and the leg being tested. You move the heel towards the shin of the other side. So if I'm testing for the right leg, I'd be moving the heel of my right leg onto the shin of the left leg. And I asked her to do that a few times as fast as she can. And she did it with her right leg. But during the left side, when I was testing her left leg and left foot, she had to concentrate a bit more. She can do it, but she needed to concentrate. And she did say that was a little bit difficult as well. All right. So there were a few things that I have observed. Sponginess of the head, the difficulty with the alternating movement of the hand, the impairment on the finger to nose test very slightly, and the impairment on the heel to shin test as well is quite impaired as well. So these are the few things. And so I was documenting that. Because I'm an occupational therapist, it is not my duty to diagnose but all I can do is show and take note of the symptoms and mention it to the doctor. So while I was documenting my notes, it is quite consistent with a cerebellar problem. So I went back again because I wanted to check how it is with her ability to assume an upright posture with her eyes closed. So I asked her to do that. With her eyes open, she was okay. And then I asked her to stand up. So with her eyes open, she was fine. I asked her to close her eyes and then she was swaying a little bit. She still maintained an upright posture. It's not a bad thing, but it's much more pronounced. And she herself found that it was a little bit difficult. That is another thing that I've checked. So why, how does it relate to cerebellar dysfunction? Because when you're standing up and you have your eyes open, then you obviously have the visual cues to get yourself upright. That would be optical writing. But then when I had her eyes closed, then she need to, needed to write herself just using the proprioceptors alone. 
And with that, she can do it, but there is more sway. Okay. There we go. Documentation, back to documentation. And then I was working with an assistant at the time. And the person herself said that the symptoms are improving. So it's no longer a huge concern. When I was documenting, I just wanted to ask her if there was a point. So I asked the assistant to go back to talk to the patient and ask if at any point she had a double vision when it was worse a good few weeks before she got admitted to the hospital. And lo and behold, the patient did say that she did have double vision. Here we go. And that is almost the last test that I can check based on the symptoms, based on the special test. And so all of these symptoms are in keeping with a posterior impairment posterior circulation impairment and it is more in keeping with cerebellar impairment as well so all of these symptoms are really in keeping with the cerebellar dysfunction so it is my duty then to just inform the doctors that these were the symptoms uh, that I have observed and it's up for the doctors to make a decision whether they want to investigate it further or not Ethically and scientifically, if you want to really identify those things, they should have done a scan to rule out any other problems. I left it at that stage. Good few weeks after, the symptom was still there. They then decided to do a scan and yes, there was a cerebellar impairment. See? Symptoms. Very easy, guys. That's just the background story. When you know the symptoms and the neurological symptoms, you can almost pinpoint as to which part of the brain is affected. So in this particular scenario, everything else was leading to the posterior part of the brain, which would have been cerebellar stroke and what would be the symptoms you can have ipsilateral problems that strength was good there is impairment in gross coordination there which are tested using uh, uh, finger nose test heel to shin test posterior circulation a Romberg sign yeah if somebody has a hemianopia so that is likely going to be a very posterior sign as well. Occipital low. So when you have, with the posterior strokes, you have occipital infarct or the cerebellum. And yes, it would be a hemianopia. And the site that's being missed, it is contralateral to the brain that is affected. If somebody has a problem on the left side of the body, it is likely that it's going to be on the right side of the brain and vice versa. If somebody has a problem on the right side of the body, then it is likely going to be on the left side of the brain. Now, if somebody has a left-sided stroke, you would expect a problem with language is that left side is the center of language. You will have problems with sequencing, potentially logical thinking, potentially with numbers. That's all function of the left side of the brain. If you have problems on the right side of the brain, you can have problems with visual spatial tasks, images and drawings, yeah. Not figures in terms of number, but images. Visual spatial task, that is something that you would be keeping an eye on. Now, when you have a problem on the right side of the brain, 
there is a chance that the person will deny the symptoms. And this is a symptom called anosognosia. That is the inability to identify the impairment. You think they just don't know something is wrong. And it will be perceived as somebody who has lack of insight. Okay. Sometimes they would have finger agnosia, an ability to tell the fingers. Prosopagnosia, inability to identify faces. Now be on the right side. Left side, communication. If somebody has a stroke on the parietal region, then you can have problems with sensation on the other side. You can almost pinpoint it. If somebody has a problem with parietal frontal region, again, you will have problems with movement as well. Again, on the contralateral side you can almost pinpoint where the problem is. If somebody has a problem on the temporal region, on the anterior part, so anterotemporal, I would say, because it's on the anterior part of the temporal region, somebody is likely to have a problem with expressive dysphasia because it is motor aphasia. They may not be able to speak it. They might not be able to say what they want to say. That would be on the temporal region. Usually on the left side too. But temporal region is temporal region. It has the same function. But it usually is very pronounced in terms of communication and language. It is more pronounced on the left side. If it is at the back part of the temporal region, then you would have problems with receptive aphasia. Symptoms alone is telling you where the problems are. The challenge, one of the challenge you would have is if somebody has had frontal lobe impairment only, where there are no motor symptoms, where there are no sensory symptoms. So the person is likely going to come up with some behaviors that are possibly confused, agitated, disorientated. It looks like they have had a very bad dementia or it looks like they've had a delirium. This is actually a praxis problem. And until you've seen enough of it, then it'll be difficult for you to identify what it is because there is a tendency that these symptoms will be described as a form of confusion and delirium. But in fact, this is, these are praxis problems. Okay? Praxis is the inability to perform purposeful movements in the absence of impairment with sensory component and motor component. A scenario and a case that I remember is that a patient was admitted. There was no formal diagnosis of stroke. The family has been complaining that their mother had been confused and couldn't cope at home. It was perceived that the mother only had a worsening of dementia, but the mother was young. And that behavior confounded with a history of depression, it masked that behavior. And you couldn't really tell because the ones that will have to diagnose these things would have to be the doctors. And the doctors tried and they couldn't. They've done a scan and there was no evidence or acute impairment so the person was not treated as somebody who's having a stroke instead it was the person was treated as someone who had worsening of mental health concerns that's 
making them agitated. It was only after about a week, once the person's been discharged home, when I got the phone call from a family member explaining to me what the problems were. And this time, based on the description that I heard on the phone, it was more pronounced. And a very simple description of their mom not being able to make a cup of tea, the very simple process of making a cup of tea, their mom not being able to manage using a shampoo. Again, this is a praxis problem, which is ideational apraxia. So those are very clear definition and these are very clear concerns of praxis problem. And then the other thing, the last symptom that the family member mentioned to me is that their mom was hitting items on the left side and does not appear to be seeing items on the left side, on which case that was a homonymous hemianopia, which could be a posterior circulation or could be the occipital region being affected. And that was it. So based on those clear definitions, I have advised the family to actually contact emergency services because they should treat it as a symptom. So those were the symptoms, guys. Again, different parts of the brain will tell you what the problems are. Oh, another scenario where I've seen a person and they were recovering from a surgery of some point. The nurse came to me and complained, saying that the leg was kicking all the time. And the arm was like moving all the time. And to me, that would be a symptom where the basal ganglia was affected. Remember the restless leg syndrome, Parkinson's disease? Yeah, that's a curriform movement, a form of chorea, curriform movement, where the impairment is on the putamen region, which is the basal ganglia and the globus pallidus. And also the processing after a procedure, for example, it can be delirious, they can be hypodelirious, but also it can also be masked by an impairment on the basal ganglia. So you have to be careful not to just isolate stroke symptoms into weakness, facial droop, yeah. The other localization that you can find, right, if, for example, there is weakness on the arm and on the lips, there's not a lot of movement on the lips, then that's likely going to be on the lateral side of the hemisphere. And then the legs is more on the medial side of the central sulcus or the central root. That's why it's easier to recover with legs because the legs does not take a huge amount of space in the brain. So a lot of coordination and movement is on the hands and on the lips. That's why talking and moving the hands, these are the worst, most one of the most difficult things to recover or to regain. Right? There we go, guys. So spoken to you about some simple cases, simple topics simple scenarios that I have encountered over the years. What would be your take? What should you take from this? If you know the symptoms, you can almost pinpoint the part of the brain where it is affected or a part of the brain that is affected. You can localize it. You can localize the problem based on the symptoms that you observe. First, you can localize it through the hemisphere. Is it left side? Is it right side? And then you can localize it through the region of the brain, being the frontal part, personality, control, coordination, behavior. Motor control would be on the anterior part as well. Parietal region would be more on the sensory region. 
and the sensitivity of the contralateral limb, you have the temporal region, which would be more on the communication, auditory interpretation. Okay, that would be the temporal region. And then on the occipital region would be hemianopia or cortical blindness. And then the cerebellar region would be more on the coordination and balance. And then if you have the brain stem, then yes, this can be a lot of things as well. There might, it's, it's tricky with the brain stem because this is where the pathways are going. So you do a CT scan, you won't normally see a problem on the CT scan, but all the conduits are there in the, at the brain stem or on the midbrain. And it is also an ipsilateral concern. So it's really strange. It will behave in a very strange way. But then again, you would have very rare impairment on this region because the circle of Willis will have to go the middle cerebral artery, the internal carotid, middle cerebral artery, uh, anterior uh, circulation, posterior circulation, everything is just got about the brain stem. So you can have locked in syndrome if you have the entire region has been blocked. So you can't move at all, which is going to be very bad. All right. So you've identified those things. Then what would be the approaches that you would use for these things? Sensory motor approaches, just stimulate, just move. Move, develop those engrams, develop those nerves. And you do this through repetitions, not just a few sit to stand, that was it. Not just a few reaches, that was it. It's got to be done over and over and over and over again. Yeah, spend some time doing some sessions, restorative sessions with a patient. At first, you may have to compensate first, do some compensatory sessions first. If you want a person to move about, give them a wheelchair straight away so they don't get isolated. After that, you give them manual handling uh, equipment, commode, manual handling equipment, just so they can manage to do the day-to-day -day things with support. But once all of these are in place, you still have to do the restorative intervention. And you can use the techniques of the sensory motor approaches like Boba, Brunstrom, Rude, P. Car Shepherd, Movement Learning. So that would be Car and Shepherds, Constraint Induced Movement Therapy, yeah? Visual Perceptual Approaches, anything. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Have a discussion with your friends. Pass this around. If you learned a little something, just remember anything you do matters and has an outcome. Until next time, bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, talk to your friends and colleagues about it. Like it, subscribe, share, and do what you can to appease whatever algorithm that is at play. Just remember, guys, anything you do matters and has an outcome. Until next time, bye.